Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, just uh, it's my simple and short uh, pleasure this evening to uh, extend a warm welcome to all our friends here. Professor Nolan, who's here from Maynooth University, and our other distinguished guests and friends and colleagues from Maynooth University. Uh, and also those of you who have gathered here this evening for this annual Patrick Corish lecture. And maybe just for a moment is my uh, uh, honour to recall, just to capture again uh, Patrick Corish, just for a moment, uh, the man we're honouring and celebrating this evening in this lecture. Uh, I, for those of you who are regulars here, you've heard this before, but uh, he was born in 1921, as many of you will recall, from County Wexford, and gave seven decades uh, of his life to this college. He, uh, he was a professor of ecclesiastical history from 1947, and in 1975 then became the professor of modern history at uh, the Maynooth University, as it is today, and uh, interrupting that marathon of, of, of scholarship by one year as being president from 1967 to 68. Uh, all of you know his classic works, Maynooth College from 19, uh, 1795 to 1995, his masterly Irish Catholic experience, uh, which was published in 1985, and also his editorship of the Archivium Hibernicum, and his work as coordinator of the, of the History of Irish Catholicism project. Well, Senior Corish, I, was I had the pleasure of knowing him in his latter years here on the staff and uh, before he retired to a nursing home. And at table, we really appreciated his uh, great sense of humanity, his uh, sense of dry, if sometimes dark, and mischievous sense of humor. And his, the anecdotes about him still abound here in the college uh, where he was highly regarded by all the staff and his students and his lectures. I was a student of his myself uh, in the 80s and his lectures are always both engaging and entertaining. So this annual lecture, uh, the Patrick Corish Lecture, is a wonderful tribute to a man who gave so much of his life and uh, his scholarship in this college, historian and scholar, and I'm delighted to welcome Father Columbus Stewart, uh, who uh, follows in the steps of a, a long list of distinguished uh, speakers and uh, scholars and historians to deliver this annual tribute to Patrick Corish. So I wish you all a very enjoyable evening and I now invite Professor Salvador Ryan to introduce our speaker this evening. So you're very welcome. <laughs> Balayuri is for Gate Falter, Krieg, and Okoid Special Tasha. You are all very, very welcome to this very special occasion tonight. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you this evening um, Columba Stewart. Columba was born in uh, Houston, Texas. He received his AB in History and Literature from Harvard University in 1979, and earned his MA in Religious Studies at Yale University in 1981. Although at one stage reputedly ha having considered a career in law, on the 11th of July 1982 he professed vows as a monk at St. John's Abbey in Minnesota, and having studied liturgical history, systematic theology and scripture at St. John's University School of Theology, he was awarded a PhD from the University of Oxford in 1989, where he wrote his thesis on Greek and Syriac asceticism under Dr. Sebastian Brock. In the following year, uh, Columba was ordained to priesthood. Columba has been a prolific scholar of early and medieval monastic studies and of Eastern Christianity, publishing a number of books, beginning with Working the Earth of the Heart, the Messalian Controversy in History, Texts and Language to 431 as part of the Oxford Theological Monograph series in 1991, and later Cassian the Monk, published by Oxford University Press in 1998, and indeed a host of academic articles and book chapters. He is currently preparing a new study of the origins of monasticism, which will be published by Oxford University Press. Since 2003, Columba has been executive director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library at Collegeville, Minnesota, 
And since then, he's become widely known for his work in locating, preserving, and digitizing endangered Christian manuscript collections in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and India. He's also led initiatives focused on the digitization of Islamic manuscripts through his partnerships with libraries in the Middle East and Ethiopia. As a result, he's admitted somewhat reluctantly in the past to holding diamond status on Delta Airlines, <laughs> earned from spending much of his time traveling from Minnesota's airport to monasteries in Ethiopia, India, Iraq, Israel, and Lebanon. It was Columbus' own research interests which brought the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library to the Middle East, where he was responsible for launching projects in East Jerusalem, Turkey, and Lebanon, looking up Syriac, Orthodox, and Christian Arab libraries that could provide insight into neighboring Benedictine heritages. He started projects in the Syrian cities of Homs and Aleppo in 2005, and in Mosul, Iraq, in 2009. The introduction of digitization transformed the project, of course, in the course of a decade, some 50,000 endangered volumes were photographed and thus preserved for posterity. With the rise of ISIS, the need for this work became even more acute. Columba partnered with Father Najib Mikhail, a Dominican friar from Iraq, who attempted to rescue what ancient documents they could from places like the monastery of Mar Bechnam in northern Iraq, that goes back to the fourth century and which was occupied and defaced by ISIS. When the city of Karakosh was attacked by ISIS, 50,000 Christians were driven out in a matter of days, many on foot, the ill on makeshift stretchers. Before Father Nahib uh, left on the final night of the siege, he in fact gathered up as many books as he could from his monastery there. And he was assisted by children as young as 12 years of age who carried their precious heritage of 13th and 14th century manuscripts with them as they fled to Kurdistan. On a night like this, I am thinking also, though, of the tragedy of human loss. Those whose lives were not spared in these many conflicts. And I, in particular, I think it would be fitting for us to remember tonight a young Chaldean Catholic priest whom many of us in this room knew as a student in Rome, Father Rachid Ghani, uh, who was shot dead in Mosul shortly after celebrating the Divine Liturgy on Trinity Sunday 2007, along with three subdeacons. There has been international recognition of Columbus Stewart's work to rescue and preserve these ancient documents, which contain the voices of minorities from the Middle East whose history has been in danger of being utterly erased. His work has featured on the CBS news program 60 Minutes, in Harvard Magazine, and on the BBC. Now, while many of us will be familiar with the story of the Monuments Men during World War II, there is an equally compelling story, which one day will be more fully told, of what I think will be called the Manuscripts Men of the early 21st century, who have sought to preserve the patrimony of minorities whose very existence in the Middle East hangs in the balance. And when that tale is eventually told, the story of Columbus Stewart, the scholar monk from Minnesota, will loom large. Columba, we who are ever more conscious of the very fragility of our world heritage, not least after witnessing recent incalculable losses as the Museo Nacional in Rio de Janeiro, described by many as a lobotomy of the Brazilian memory, as we think of events like that tonight, we also, in particular, owe a debt of enormous gratitude to you, 
and to so many others who have worked with you in this vital work of cultural preservation. Columba, we look forward very much to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for this warm welcome and thanks to Father Milani and the hospitality here at Maynooth. Thanks to Salvador for the invitation and for the kind hospitality. Any American Roman Catholic has heard about Maynooth since virtually the cradle because of those legions of Irish priests who are often found in our parishes. So it's a great honor, despite having been in Ireland several times, to make my first visit to Maynooth today. And it's been a great visit. And I'm very honored to give the Chorish lecture. I made the mistake of looking at the list of people who've given it previously. And then I made the further mistake last night of watching the video of Peter Brown, my mentor and friend, give his lecture in 2014. You're not going to get that. But you are, I think, going to get something that you'll find interesting and uh, which I will tell with a number of images, which might at least keep you awake. So my task tonight is to explain a little bit about the work that Salvador was just introducing, and I'll do it essentially under four headings. I'll talk first about the threat to manuscripts and why that matters. Secondly, responses to those threats over the centuries. Thirdly, present efforts undertaken by my monastery and the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library at St. John's in Minnesota present efforts to respond to the threat using the best tools available today. And then as part of that, give you a survey of the work that we've been doing with endangered Eastern Christian communities in the Mideast and Africa, and just a little peek at the work we've been doing with Islamic manuscripts. And finally, and very importantly for the scholars in the audience, know that there are many, I'll be saying something about archiving and access. Because, as we all know from our holidays, so what if you take the picture? If you don't know what it is, and if you lose the disc or the thumb drive or whatever else it is you put it on, it's gone. So part of our responsibility is making sure that doesn't happen. So let's go ahead. I'd like to show this image of an, a, not perhaps an endangered manuscript, but a manuscript that's been around for a while. And like many of us has seen a few things and bears on its face some of its experiences. At first glance, this marvelously worm-eaten manuscript is understood by most people to be coming out of what religious tradition? Taking a quick glance at it. It's written in Arabic, so the assumption is it's a Quran or some other Islamic manuscript. And in fact, it is an Arabic language, Greek Orthodox, Byzantine Rite, Horologion or basically Book of the Liturgy of the Hours, used by Antiochian Orthodox Christians in Lebanon and Syria. It dates from the 18th century, at a time when they had transitioned from their historic Syriac language to using the language of their surrounding culture, which had long been their own vernacular, Arabic. What I like about the worms that attacked this manuscript is that they were evidently literate because you'll see they avoided the letters. So they ate whatever they could, but they had a respect for the psalm or the hymn or the kentakion or whatever else it was and didn't actually eat it. So when we think about the threats to manuscript culture, remembering that everything we know about how ancient people thought and felt came to us in manuscripts. Their monuments tell us things, their art tell us things, but the words in their heads and their hearts, those we know from manuscripts. One of the threats is the fact that manuscripts are simply fairly fragile objects. And if you get them wet, if you leave them outside, if the insects get at them, they're gone. But there are other threats as well. Some of you may recognize this as the former uh, historical archive, the Historisches Archiv in Cologne, Germany. This is where the memory of much of Northern Germany, including manuscripts taken from Benedictine and other monasteries at the time of the Reformation, 
Uh, this is where it all went, into one of these great state institutions where in places affected by the Reformation or the French Revolution or Napoleonic period, all of these things were kind of hoovered up and taken into state libraries. One morning in 2007, the whole thing collapsed. They were digging a new uh, underground, so putting in a new sort of underground railway, and somebody had not done a proper engineering survey. And so they were digging a tunnel, and the whole building collapsed into it like a collapsing uh, house of cards, taking with it medieval manuscripts, modern archives, photographs, essentially everything that had been put into that ultra-modern, ultra-secure storehouse of knowledge. A similar example, also from Germany, which today we think of as eminently safe, is the fire at the Anna Amalea Bibliothek in Weimar. So you see the fire burning this historic building. It took with it the printed book collection of that well-known library. Fortunately, the medieval manuscripts were safe. And fortunately for both the Historicist Archive and for this library, we had in fact microfilmed the medieval manuscripts. So many other things were lost, but there had been at least some effort to preserve them before the crisis. Much of what I'll speak about tonight, however, has to deal with threats like this, a car bombing in Lebanon, the random nature of violence that we find not only in places like the Middle East, but even in major cities of Europe and in the United States. The fact that something uh, terribly destructive can happen without any warning whatsoever and take with it whatever is nearby human beings, monuments, buildings, and cultural heritage. Another threat, which is also relevant to our work, is that posed by collectors, the black market. This is a very handsome 15th century Ethiopian manuscript of some importance, having books of the Old Testament. You can see it has a very distinctive design on the right-hand side. This is the online catalog entry uh, from the prominent Scandinavian collection in which it is now found. Now, those who were uh, into following auctions and what happens to cultural heritage these days will immediately go to the line marked provenance because they'll want to know where it came from. And what you see there is the name of a dealer. So, where did it come from? It came from Ethiopia, where we had microfilmed it in the 1970s. So it was in a monastery. We filmed it cataloged it, described it. A few years pass, Ethiopia experiences revolution, civil war, and next thing you know, it's in London, and then it's in Oslo. So, this is not exactly what was supposed to happen to that manuscript, but at least this one is known. Think of all the other manuscripts that disappear in a tourist suitcase. Go to a collector who doesn't choose to make known the fact that he or she has amassed this fabulous collection of Ethiopian or Syriac or Arabic or Latin or whatever type of manuscript. So the threats are many. So when manuscripts are imperiled and you need to make sure that there's a copy of it somewhere, what's the obvious answer? Well, you call one of us. So this is how we used to do it. So uh, my monastic forebears uh, spent a lot of time hunched over copy desks like this uh, gathering manuscripts, making sure there was a copy available for use, and all of those cliches we have about monks, whether in Ireland or elsewhere, who kept the texts alive. But the immediate predecessor, actually, for what we've been doing in our work is a more modern monastic project, and that is the work of the Congregation of Saint-Marc, one of the French Reformed Benedictine congregations arising after the Reformation, uh, particularly in the form of its great scholar, Jean Mabillon. And maybe many of you know of him and his work. He essentially invented the modern science of Latin diplomatics and paleography by doing a systematic historic study of manuscripts and the evolution of their scripts and so on. He was also a great collector of manuscripts, either acquiring them from churches and monasteries where they were thought to be obsolete with the rise of printing, or by uh, arranging for copies of them to be made. And so he and his successors did these marvelous voyages littéraires as they went through France and Italy and all across Europe, trying to find these manuscripts and taking them to their monastery at Saint-Germain-des-Prés, where if you visit the church, which is left of it in Paris, you can see the memorial to Mabillon, which at one time was actually his tomb, 
his remains disappeared at the time of the revolution, but they rescued the plaque. And they had this marvelous library, which then became the core of the Bibliothèque Nationale. So the manuscripts are still there, it's just you have to see them under different auspices. So if you fast forward then, the French Revolution, the ups and downs of the 19th century, and then you get into the 20th century and two world wars, people began to be anxious. And some of us in the room are old enough to remember the Cold War and the possibility that there would be a World War III in Europe, that it would be nuclear, and that there would be a massive destruction of cultural heritage, far worse than what had been seen even in those catastrophic two wars on European soil earlier in the century. So some Benedictines began to be anxious about what would happen, and they realized that monasteries in Austria, through all the ups and downs of the previous centuries, had kept their manuscripts. Everywhere else in Europe, they disappeared into state libraries. But in Austria, they kept them, so what were we going to do? So my predecessor, Father Oliver Kapsner, the founder of what is now the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, said we should go microfilm manuscripts in Austrian monasteries. And so he went around from door to door asking Austrian abbots if he could microfilm their manuscripts. So here's an American who, although he spoke German since childhood, being from one of those German-American farm families, was still an American. And he was talking about microfilm, whatever that was, and asking them to open their libraries of great medieval manuscripts to this project. Finally, after many refusals, he met a young abbot, recently returned from studies in Rome, who was au fait with what was considered to be technology in those days, and said, you'll start here. And so the project began with the mobile microfilming studio you see here in this wonderful Volkswagen that some of us remember as kind of the great uh, exploring vehicle of the 1960s that you take on your cross-country trips and so on. And they set up shop in these medieval libraries. So you see the stacks of medieval manuscripts on the floor. We discourage that practice today. But they were microfilming them uh, quickly and then producing this extraordinary archive and rather systematic coverage of libraries, not only of Benedictine uh, monasteries in Austria and then Germany and other parts of Europe, but also other religious orders and state libraries, including the Austrian National Library. Since 2003, we have continued the project using digital technology. And we have switched our focus away from Europe for the most part, except for some work in Eastern Europe, to parts of the world which cannot do the work themselves. Uh, countries in the European Union have access to all kinds of resources for this kind of work, but people in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia do not. So we have started a new project with digital imaging, and we've been working with communities of various kinds including uh, this group of three young Armenians in Istanbul, who then went on to digitize the only Armenian manuscripts that remained in church hands in Turkey after the Armenian genocide. So all the others either left Turkey to go to the Republic of Armenia or to places like Lebanon or Syria, or they simply disappeared. And then about 750 made it to Istanbul, uh, where they were able to be digitized. So we're continuing in the digital age, the work of our Benedictine forebears, whether they be copyists in the Middle Ages or the Congregation of Saint Mar, which is exemplified in one of my favorite discoveries, which is the Jean Mabillon iPhone case. <laughs> so this brings it all together, monks, manuscripts, digital, and so on. So tonight I'd like to speak particularly about the work that we've done in a, a rather forgotten part of the historic Christian world. Many of you know this depiction of the Christian world by Heinrich Bunting, I think it's 1581 or so, if I remember. And he's depicting the Christian world as consisting of three equal parts. You have Europe, Asia, and Africa with the holy city of Jerusalem in its center. And then where I come from, just beginning to peak in the lower left-hand corner, uh, maybe a few Christians there, but you couldn't really take it seriously yet. This is perhaps a last moment in European understandings of Christian history where there would be recognition of the vast historical significance of Christians in the Middle East and other parts of Asia as far as India, as well as in Africa, that these were ancient, important Christian communities. 
rather than viewing these through the later lens of mission territory. And then the surprise of European missionaries who got there and discover people who say, we're already Christian. And then the problem being that they weren't the right kind of Christian. So I'll focus on the lobe of the, um, the flower, which is marked Asia, which covers quite a bit of territory. And you can see under the Latin name on the map, the current name of some of these places. So we have Damascus, we have Antioch, we have Haran, Babylon or Baghdad, Nineveh, modern day Mosul. Uh, this is our territory. And these are the places that we'll be looking at a bit this evening. So before we go there, I just want to say a very quick word about how we do what we do when we go to these places, as we did with those young Armenians in Istanbul. So our plan has always been, since 1965 when we started, to photograph complete manuscript collections. We don't choose what we think is important because we don't want to make that decision for scholars 200 years from now. Because what people think is important now may actually be of much less interest than something that will be recognized as bearing cultural history or significance sometime later. We hope to cover and typically cover whole regions, not just individual collections, because the idea is to offer a depiction of an entire manuscript culture, which cannot be localized in a single place or library. We train and employ local workers like those three Armenian students who helped to get through their university studies because we paid them to take those photographs. We safely archive and share the images. The owners keep a copy of all of it and whatever commercial rights they can wring out of them are theirs. Uh, and the reality is, sadly, there isn't a big market for manuscript images because they're studied by people like us who are, don't tend to have a lot of money. But if they want to reprint them and, and put them online and so on, that's all fine. They can do all of that. But they allow us to keep a copy and to share it with scholars through the digital platforms I'll tell you more about later. And then the last thing we do, which has become very important since the Syrian civil war and since 2014 in Iraq, is track the changing status of collections. Location, things that go missing, and we've devised ways of depicting that, presenting that in the catalog I'll show you later. So our current and recent projects cover these places. So this is where I'm tending to bounce around. So that diamond status on Delta is, believe me, earned, <laughs> because I spend a good part of each year, about a third of each year on the road, uh, going to visit these various locations. And I'm gonna focus this evening, as I say, particularly on the work that we've done in the Middle East and a, a bit in Africa. And I'll have to leave the work we've done in South Asia uh, for another occasion, because it's really its own thing, although it is an extension of the great Syriac Mesopotamian culture that I'll say more about this evening. So th uh, this is a map that indicates the historic region that we have been working in. And I spoke a bit about this this afternoon in a seminar. So you see the uh, Syrian Mesopotamian region as it existed in the middle of the fourth century. And so you can see the well-defined provinces of the Roman Empire on the left, and on the right, the wild country of the Persian Empire, which wasn't wild at all, but it was from the perspective of Romans who didn't understand that the Persians were just as organized as the Romans were. But the work that we do essentially covers that whole sweep from Aleppo, ancient Berea, all the way across to ancient Arbella, modern Erbil, which is the capital of the Kurdish autonomous region in modern day Iraq. That whole area, that whole Grand Arc was the homeland of Syriac Christianity. Uh, extremely important early Christian culture, widespread throughout the region and then along the Silk Road and into India. Bearer of a rich literature and culture, suffered terribly, particularly from the 12th century onwards and now exists primarily in diaspora communities. But a tremendous legacy, which is becoming better and better known in the Western world, as people realize that there was in fact theological life and learning outside the Greco-Roman ambit, 
which is what we have been most familiar with in the way that we've been brought up. So this is an area where we've done quite a lot of work. This is a view of the Mesopotamian plain looking into Syria, taking from Mardin, which I'll tell you more about in just a moment. And as you look into the distance, and if you peer co closely, you see all these mounds. And you think, isn't that hilly? And then you think, no, those are awfully regular looking mounds, aren't they? And you realize, oh, it's just like Ireland. You have all of these archeological sites everywhere you look, which are vestiges of these earlier civilizations, which have never been excavated because there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So it's an enormously significant region. The Syriac language, which is uh, a dialect of Aramaic, the lingua franca of the entire Near East in the ancient world, was the literary dialect of Edessa. And Edessa is famous for many reasons in Christian history. Uh, and Edessa remains uh, a rather interesting town in southeast Turkey, where it is currently known as Shanli Urfa, which is its Turkish name, meaning glorious Urfa but it is the ancient city of Edessa. And you can visit a sacred pool if you go there today, which has been sacred by every civilization that ever lived there. So it's sacred for changing reasons or explanations, but the same very hungry carp seem to have lived in that pond forever. And you can still uh, buy the little pan of feed and uh, take your life in your hands by throwing some of it in to the sacred pool. Today, it's a very tranquil site surrounded by various madrasas. So here you see them around. But then if you look at the upper left-hand corner of this image, you see a square tower, which serves today as the minaret for one of these uh, madrasas. And you think that doesn't look terribly Islamic or vernacular in architecture. And then you realize it's one of the vestiges of the Christian churches of Edessa. Another one not far away, the ancient baptistry of the cathedral in Edessa, which is now uh, also used as a clock tower and a minaret. And you begin to realize that this town, which has been devoid of Christians since 1923, when they all left the second wave of persecutions that followed the Armenian genocide, and which targeted particularly Syriac Christians, all the Christians are gone. And their monuments now are mosques or cultural centers or clock towers. And you wonder, well, what happened to them? So this is part of the story we'll tell tonight. Not far away is a second city of tremendous significance for Syriac history, Nisibis, modern day New Sibene. It happens to lie now on the border between Turkey and Syria, which has not been a friendly border for many decades and has been a very, very sensitive area since the Syrian Civil War. Gertrude Bell, known to many of you as the indefatigable explorer of uh, this part of the world in the early 20th century, took this photograph of the lonely triumphal arch of Nisibis as it appeared then, and it looks exactly like that now, because most of the ancient city is in the no man's land between Turkey and Syria, so it's never been excavated. Nisibis is where the great Syriac poet and theologian Ephraim of Nisibis, who I think is the only Syriac writer who actually appears in the Roman calendar, whose feast is on, this will be of interest to those in the room, June 9th, which is also the feast of St. Columba, my patron. So it, it's a complicated day for me uh, when, when we get to June. Fortunately, on the Turkish side of the border has been preserved the baptistry of a fourth century church in Nisibis, and a baptistry associated with the Bishop Jacob of Nisibis. And this very interesting baptistry, which seems to us to be in a remote corner of the Christian world, bears an extraordinary Greek inscription that runs along one side of it. And you can barely make out the Greek letters uh, sort of in the center of the photograph. It was deciphered, of course, by Germans early on and extensively published. And you see the inscription reporting that this baptistry was erected and completed in the year 671 of the Greeks, 359 AD, and names the bishop and so on. A reminder that there was an extraordinary reach of learning, not only indigenous Syriac, but also the presence of the Greek world with its language, philosophy, and culture 
even in this area that we think of today as remote, which was certainly not in its day. Not far from there is the town of Diabakir, which is ancient Amida, if you study late antique or Roman history. This is a rather grim 19th century church built on the site of an ancient medieval church, which has the grave of Dionysius Barcelibi, one of the important later Syriac authors. We digitize manuscripts here, including this extraordinary 6th century gospel book. Now, as I noted this afternoon in the seminar, those who work with Latin and Greek manuscripts can only marvel at the fact that you have lots of Syriac manuscripts from the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries, where there's a handful of them in Latin and in Greek. Look at that extraordinary depiction of the face of Christ. Looking a bit bewildered at what has happened since the mission that he led in Galilee so long ago. But the sensitivity of that portrait can help but remind us of these beautiful paintings that come from the cemeteries in Egypt, these things written around the time of Christ, or painted around the time of Christ, to be put on coffins to depict um, local people who were buried using the encaustic wax technique familiar to us from the early Sinai icons. The closest we get to a photograph of an ancient person or to an understanding of how ancient people saw each other, just as they saw their Christ. Not far is Mardin. This is the place I took the photograph of the Mesopotamian plain from that I opened with. It's a town now of about 75,000 people, almost all of whom are Kurds, which is a change since the 20th century. It had a significant Christian population until 1923, representing every conceivable kind of Christian, including American Presbyterian missionaries, but every flavor of Eastern Catholic and Orthodox you can imagine. There's one functioning church left in Mardin, which is a Syriac Orthodox church dedicated to the 40 martyrs, uh, so popular among Eastern Christians. And you can see in the distance, this is a sixth century church building, the pastor of that church, Abuna Gabriel Akhuz, who is the last priest in Mardin, and who from Sunday to Sunday goes around to the various churches, irrespective of their church tradition, and gathers the remaining hundred Christians of Mardin to celebrate the liturgy. This is what ecumenism looks like on the ground when you don't have the luxury of having a priest for every small little group around town. Abuna Gabriel and his family are guardians of one of the most important Syriac manuscript collections in the Near East, and with their 14 children are always doing, also doing their best to repopulate Mardin <laughs> with its Christians, but it is more than one couple, however valiant, can accomplish. But I'm happy to say that we employed uh, three of his children on our digitization project, including things like this marvelous 13th century gospel book with an album of depictions of various biblical scenes, both from the Gospels and from the Acts of the Apostles. This is the Ascension, and if we had time to look at it quite closely, it's very interesting because it has both Greek and Syriac um, notations on it or inscriptions on it, and it tells you all sorts of interesting things about uh, what was seen as the more privileged language and also the fact that although Greek has a certain place of honor, they had a rather imprecise way of spelling it because they didn't actually know it, but they knew that if they were going to create a high art, they need to have some Greek on it. Down the street from that church is one which hasn't had a priest since the late 1960s, but has recently been renovated. This is the Chaldean Catholic Church. The Chaldeans, the large Christian group of Iraq, but borders didn't really exist in an earlier era, so there were plenty of them in this corner of southeast Turkey. And that church also has a very significant collection of about a thousand Syriac manuscripts, representing primarily the East Syriac tradition, which would be that of the Chaldeans, the Assyrian Church of the East, and then uh, their kindred in the mission that went to the Malabar coast of India. Here's an example, a 19th century liturgical manuscript, but you see the distinctive East Syriac uh, script and some of the ornament, which is typical of this tradition. This particular manuscript collection was cataloged in the late 19th and early 20th century, along with the Chaldean manuscripts of Diabakir, by the learned Archbishop Adai Sher, 
who was an Iraqi who was made bishop in Sert, which is to the north and the east of Mardin, and who also had a, a marvelous library of his own. Adai Sher was killed in 1915 during the Armenian Genocide, and his personal library was destroyed. We don't know if it was destroyed before he was killed or after, but we lost his learning and we certainly lost his manuscripts, including the only surviving copy in Syriac of the full translation of Theodore Mopsuestia's treatise on the Incarnation. Only copy, known to exist, destroyed. So he had cataloged those manuscripts, which were left behind in Diyarbakir when the last priest left and the community dwindled. Further east is the monastery of Mar Gabriel, an outpost of living Syriac culture not far from the Syrian border, where every day in this magnificent 7th century church, a choir of young Syriac Orthodox boys, some from the area, some sent by their parents now living in Germany and Sweden in the diaspora, sent to school to learn their language and to chant the liturgy morning and evening with the small monastic community. This lovely church shows that somebody knew what they were doing when they built it, and the mosaics in the sanctuary were done, perhaps art historians think, by the same mosaicists who did those in the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, Christian mosaicists from Constantinople. Now you ask, the Dome of the Rock, isn't that Muslim? And weren't they from Constantinople and Christian? Then they're doing a monastery in, in um, this far eastern part of modern day Turkey. Well, a job is a job. But the point is that this place, which again seems so remote at one time, was an enormous monastery with more than a thousand monks. Nearby in Midyat, a Christian town uh, which has been there for a very long time in association with Mar Gabriel, you find charming more recent manuscripts like this one depicting the entry of Christ into Jerusalem in a style which the Western snob might be tempted to dismiss initially as being rather folk but then upon closer examination, one learns this is actually quite an art, uh, a sophisticated artistic tradition. And I'll show you another example of this shortly. My last visit there was in 2012, and they had just finished building a nice refugee camp on the Turkish side of the border for the people coming from Syria who came shortly thereafter. You'll see it's divided into two parts, one part for Christians, one part for Muslims. And if you look carefully, Yes, this may be a refugee camp, but it equally could, could be considered a concentration camp to deal with the threat thought to be posed by these refugees from Syria. So now we turn toward contemporary troubles and what we've been dealing with uh, in these last several years. We did a lot of work in Aleppo, famous for its Umayyad Mosque, which is not as flashy as the larger one in Damascus but nonetheless is, was quite a handsome, beautiful structure. And I spent a lot of time in my visits to Aleppo wandering the um, alleyways of the old city and then the Christian quarter, uh, visiting various libraries and churches to persuade them to let us digitize their manuscripts. And I'm happy to say that almost all of them did. Extraordinary things like this Armenian gospel book, which if we just flash the image up on the screen, you'd be tempted to think was European. Maybe it's even English or something. And then you look more closely, no, it's Armenian. It really is different from some of this European style. But it's a reminder that Armenian manuscript culture presents this curious kind of hybrid between the Byzantine and the Latin, because the Armenian Christians have always been, in a sense, between those two larger cultural groups. I mentioned the Christians of Edessa who left in 1923 and they went to Aleppo. And here you see a photograph of their refugee camp upon their arrival in 1923, a photograph that I was shown by the last surviving member of that group that came from Orfa in 1923, Abraham Nuro, who died, I think, in 2009. I met him in 2008. They brought with them their manuscripts, which were kept in their new church in Aleppo, which is the Church of the Refugees from Orfa, and here you see it locked in a safe in their church, being opened by their bishop, Mar Gregorios, Metropolitan of Aleppo, Mar Gregorios Yohanna Ibrahim, Syriac Orthodox, 
on the occasion of a seminar in Aleppo in 2008. He was taking out of the vault the only complete copy in Syriac of an extraordinary 12th century chronicle or world history, which was written by a patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church at a time when the Crusaders had turned up from Europe announcing, we've come to liberate you. So, those of you who know the history of the Crusades or those of you who know what happened after my compatriots went into Iraq in 2003, know that the arrival of the foreigner in the interest of liberating the minorities is not always a wise or successful venture. And Michael records in his chronicle, here held by Sebastian Brock, my Syriac teacher at Oxford, greatest living Syriacist. Michael records in his chronicle uh, the punishment inflicted on the local Christians by their Muslim rulers for the arrival of the Franks, the foreigners, who had come with this mission of liberation. Particularly this little passage, which describes the fact that the Christians were forbidden to ring their church bells. And so this was one of the punishments inflicted upon them. I'm happy to say that Mar Gregorios, after many visits to Aleppo, uh, allowed us to digitize all of the manuscripts of his library, including that one. And in 2009, we were able to present it, or 2010 actually, we were able to present it to him, uh, along with a group of benefactors of our library, in a visit to Aleppo. And a printed facsimile was made, and there it is. 2011, the Syrian war broke out. So here you see that same Umayyad mosque I showed you earlier. On the right, there's a pile of rubble. That is the later medieval minaret, which had been blown to smithereens. Mar Gregorios himself was kidnapped along with the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Aleppo in April of 2013, and they were never heard from since. So, Syria, Aleppo. Everyone says it's the most stable country in the Middle East, Nothing will ever happen there because Assad has the place firmly in hand. And then with virtually no notice, I having been in Syria for the last, last time in April, March 2011, uh, the first struggles broke out one week later. And this was the harbinger of this new wave of turmoil. There had been 2003 in its aftermath. Now you have Syria and Iraq to which we now turn. And the terrible tragedies that have afflicted the so-called Nineveh Triangle in northern Iraq since 2014. So there you see this region in the north with Mosul on the western side, Erbil in the Kurdish area on the eastern side. And as you run up all the way to the Turkish border, this is historically an ancient Jewish, Christian, and Yazidi region. The Jews are all gone. They had to leave because of the tensions between Israel and the various Arab states. The Yazidis have become a small minority, which we heard a lot about in 2014. And the Christians have retained their presence in some of these villages. So my partner there, as was mentioned in the introduction, is Father Najib Mikael, a Dominican of the Priory of Mosul, uh, which is actually part of uh, the French Dominican province, is it Toulouse? Which one? Paris. It is Paris, okay. So they're actually under French Dominican uh, control, but they're all Iraqis. And this is this extraordinary Dominican presence which began in the 18th century with Italians, and then it was taken over by French, and they did a lot of evangelizing and so on, and then at a certain point realized that there were limits to what they could do in terms of conversion. So they did all kinds of wonderful pastoral work and ethnography. So amazing work in describing the peoples they met, learning the languages, and taking photographs. So Father Najib, by training a petroleum engineer before he entered the Dominicans, had the idea um, even before 2003 that the manuscripts and books belonging to the Dominicans of Mosul should be copied, because you just never know. At that time, the threat was that people were coming and just taking them and not returning them. Probably some of his fellow Dominicans would put one in their room and you never knew if it would make its way back to the library. This is the way it is in religious houses. But the wisdom of his project became clear after 2003 and particularly after it became impossible for the Dominicans to remain in Mosul, uh, not because they were a particular target of religious persecution, 
but because Mosul after 2003 became rather lawless and uh, priests and religious could command a high ransom if they were kidnapped. And so there was a lot of criminal activity involved uh, with uh, Christian leaders in Mosul. And so the Dominicans left and they went to Karakosh, which is one of these ancient Christian villages in the Nineveh Plain between Mosul and Erbil. I first visited Iraq in 2009, going over on uh, Ash Wednesday. So somebody said, what are you doing for Lent? And I said, I'm going to Iraq, what about you? So that's where I went. So I went to Iraq and uh, had the, the joy of attending a diaconal ordination in one of the Syriac Catholic churches in Karakosh. So there in Karakosh, the Dominicans had taken their manuscripts, including this very interesting 18th century gospel book. So here you see one of these things, which again, the initial glance, you might think, oh, it's folky and it's naive and so on. And then you look more closely and you say, look at those Matisse things going on. And this is actually quite interesting. So very distinctive artistic style. 2014, the arrival of the Islamic State or ISIS. The destruction of ancient monuments, such as ancient Nimrud, destroyed with barrel bombs and bulldozers. The destruction of the shrine of Mar Benam and his sister Mart Sarah, which was leveled in one of the ISIS-produced videos, which was then circulated on YouTube. That's what remains of this ancient pilgrimage site. And then in the latter stages of the war, the destruction of the modern Mosul University Library by American airstrikes. So, destruction of culture, ancient and modern, and the displacement of the Christian population, who in August of 2014 had to leave Karakosh and the other villages of the Nineveh Triangle with virtually no notice and find their way over, let's see, 40 miles, you can do the conversion yourselves, in the Iraqi heat of August to find refuge in Erbil. They were finally able to go back only in 2017 which is when uh, ISIS was pushed out of this region. And I had the opportunity to go back very soon thereafter in May of 2017 to the same church where I had experienced that diacal, diaconal ordination. It had been tidied by those brave few who had gone back, but of course it's literally a shell of what it once was. But meanwhile, Father Najib had trained a team of young Iraqis, all young people who otherwise would have been unemployed to rescue manuscripts damaged in one place or another, including manuscripts like this beautiful 12th century gospel buried in Baghdad in 2003 to protect it from the war that was coming. And it turns out it was actually a manuscript taken originally from Diyarbakir, where Archbishop Adai Sher had cataloged it in the early 20th century. Now simply fragments lasted until 2003 and then destroyed by ill-advised efforts to save it. So we've also worked in the holy city of Jerusalem, very near the Temple Mount, the Arama Sharif, with Syriac manuscripts belonging to the Syriac Orthodox community of St. Mark's Monastery. This is the librarian, Abu Shimun, and they happen to have the oldest surviving copy of a book that was part of my doctoral dissertation. And I'm happy to say that's now digitized and online. And nearby, a first example of a recent turn we've taken in our work, which is the family library of one of the prominent Muslim families of the old city, the Budairi family. This is one of the gates going on to the Temple Mount or the Arama Sharif, which non-Muslims may not enter. But right next to it is the Budairi family home. The view from our digitization studio, which goes right onto the platform, looking at the Dome of the Rock. And there we've worked with the family uh, to digitize about 1,100 very important manuscripts of Islamic jurisprudence, theology, and so on. Why did we do them? If we're going to do Christian ones in Jerusalem, we should do Islamic manuscripts as well, because the people have lived together, their libraries have been close to each other, and to capture the intellectual culture of the old city, you have to be inclusive. We've also done work in Ethiopia, just a touch on Africa before we uh, move on to access. The Monastery of Abu Garima in Tigray with the ancient Abu Garima Gospels. This is a collaborative project. We actually brought one of our technicians working with the abbot of the monastery and a representative of the Ethiopian Tewahedo Orthodox Church to digitize this oldest known Ethiopian manuscript. A carbon dated 
fourth or fifth century. A lot of people refuse to believe it can actually be that old in Ethiopia. Um, you decide. And then our currently our largest single project is working with the manuscripts of Timbuktu, much in the news last several years because of the takeover of Timbuktu by various forces, very complicated situation. This very distinctive West African Islam with its vernacular architecture. The manuscripts evacuated from Timbuktu to the capital of Bamako from the desert to a very humid climate where I first saw them a year after their evacuation in 2013 and where we've been working hard to digitize them with local Malians who dress like this every day, by the way. So uh, they certainly have more fashion sense than the Benedictines. So what are the challenges and what do we do with it? And we're in the home stretch here. So it's not always an easy landing. This is my favorite airport sign in the world. And you wonder who thought it was smart to depict the angle of landing of that plane in quite that way. And uh, the astute observer might deduce from the fact that it is in both French and Arabic that it is from Lebanon. So this is the Beirut airport. So uh, it, it's more welcoming coming in and then going out, you get the warning. We also experience things like this. This is actually, this next one is from Ukraine, but it, it makes the point that you get to the intersection, which is like this, and you can't go straight ahead either. Uh, and so very often we've had the experience of wondering, why didn't they tell us back there where we could have gone left or right or turned around but it doesn't work that way. So what happens to all of these hundreds of thousands, millions of digital photographs? They find their way back to our place in Minnesota. So here is a classic Benedictine complex as founded by Bavarian monks in the 19th century who looked for lakes and trees and a place where you could put a little chapel across the water so you could have this little thing to look at and meditate on. And there we have our monastery and our school and our university seminary and so on, and the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. Summer view, winter view. So it, it is a rather ferocious climate, but as I tell people in the summer, it's delightful and in the winter we get a lot of work done. So we put all of the images on servers. Those of you who work with digital things know you have to have multiple copies. You have to keep them in many different places. You can't just have one copy in a shoebox under your bed. And we do put a copy of everything inside a mountain in Utah, which is uh, up the canyon from where the Mormons have all their microfilm. You may know that they have all these enormous collections of genealogical records. So uh, come Armageddon or uh, whatever, or the Canadian attack when they come pouring over that northern border uh, sometime in the future, I'll be down in Utah with my friends from Brigham Young University at our respective caves. So uh, just to summarize with, so what have we accomplished and then how do you look at it? So when you look at the uh, manuscripts we digitized in the Middle East in these various countries, you see numbers of collections and approximate numbers of manuscripts. So this is a lot of manuscripts. Those of us who work with manuscripts aren't used to thinking of collections as numbering in their thousands, unless it's the Vatican or the British Library or the Bibliothèque Nationale. And then when you um, take a slightly different view and look at them by language and uh, where you can find manuscripts for research, and you see on the top line, all of the manuscripts that were able to be taken from these places by uh, European colonialists and American adventurers in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, which formed the research collections of the British Library and so on, and you see what they've got, and then you see what we've digitized in these various regions, you see that we basically did what they didn't get. And so you put their collections and our digital collections together, and you get a much better approximation of what the kind of 360 degree view is of these places. And uh, it's a lot of stuff. So there are many doctoral theses which are sitting out there waiting for you to write on the basis of these collections. And yes, you can look at them. We have a site called V Himmel or Virtual Himmel. We call our place Himmel, Himmel Museum Manuscript Library. So you need to have a shorter version. We're founded by Germans, so Himmel sounds right. So if you're interested in manuscripts, you go to heaven, uh, even though we're in a basement, and you can look at everything. But you can see it online, and there you can uh, see about 30,000 manuscripts now. We're putting more and more up all the time. 
And one of the features of our catalog, as I mentioned earlier, is the fact that you can uh, note in there if the manuscript has been moved, if it's been lost, if it's uh, been sold, if its current status is unknown. So just to tease you, a couple of interesting things you find. Um, when you open up these manuscripts from places like the Armenian Archdiocese of Aleppo, where you saw that earlier lovely um, sort of depiction of a gospel scene, you open up that Armenian manuscript and you find a surprise. So here's a manuscript written in Istanbul, actually, in the early 15th century, with a Latin liturgical book, which has been recycled as flyleaves. Now, those who work with manuscripts know you recycle older manuscripts. You don't throw anything away, use them for bindings and so on. But when you find Armenians in Istanbul recycling Latin manuscripts, you sort of wonder what happened. Then you think about the Crusades and you think about all of these struggles and you wonder about communities which disappear for whatever reason and then their manuscripts are left behind and Armenians say, well, I don't, we don't need Latin manuscripts. Let's reuse them in ours. Or this one, which is also from Istanbul, although presently in Aleppo, which really sets the pulse racing of Latin paleographers who stand up and shout, Beneventum! So although it's a later manuscript, 1593, it's using uh, a manuscript which could be dated from the 11th or 12th century, possibly 13th, which could be a remnant of one of those trading colonies in Constantinople, again reused uh, later by Armenians. So these kinds of connections, movement of manuscripts, ideas, and people, is what people are going to be discovering in the uh, descriptions of the manuscripts as they find their way online. So a uh, shout out to our sponsors. Uh, we are a not-for-profit project. We do not receive um, extensive government grants and so on, although we've benefited from some small grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and so on. Arcadia, based in London, is our major funder currently, but we rely on a lot of private foundations and agencies for support. So if you're interested, here are the URLs. Uh, check it out. HMML.org is our basic site. And then VHMML, VHIMML, is where you can look at manuscripts and begin to explore. Thank you. So just to repeat for, for, the, for the crowd, a recording of Syriac manuscripts in India, we have in fact. We've, we've done quite a lot of work in Kerala, in southwest India, with the St. Thomas Christians. Uh, the, there are Syriac manuscripts as well as Malayalam manuscripts. The complication is that the older Syriac manuscripts were destroyed by the Portuguese when they arrived because they corrected them to reflect Roman Catholic theology rather than the, um, the East Syrian tradition theology which was found in them. So the effort to find pre-Portuguese manuscripts is, is really quite a challenge. Uh, but we have done quite a lot of work there, both with manuscript codices in Syriac and in Malayalam, as well as palm leaf archival records. And uh, they have been imaged, they're beginning to be described, but we're really hoping to, that we'll be able to help scholars both in India and elsewhere learn more about relationships between the various religious groups in Kerala, as well as the theological and spiritual life of those Christians. Questions? And then the second question, which is a little bit contentious, but 
any of these manuscripts that you that you tracked, have any of them uh, landed up in the Museum of the Bible? So first question, what happens to the manuscripts after the, the project and does the fact that they've become better known make them more vulnerable? Uh, so th there are a couple of things. One is that uh, typically the collections are better kept after the project than before because they've understood, in a sense, why they are important and how they should care for them. So that's gratifying. Um, given the conflict that's arisen, many of the manuscripts have been moved and hidden. And uh, so they're, they're safe for the most part, although some in Mosul were in fact destroyed and others are unknown, which means that the online access is even more crucial because there's no other way to actually see them. Uh, in terms of alerting people to their existence and will that make them more vulnerable, I think they're pretty well protected actually, um, but let's just say I hope not. And the nice thing about having the photographs of them is that it's proof of ownership. So that if something should turn up on the market or in a museum, they can say this was certainly in Aleppo in X year when it was digitized as part of the project. Um, I don't think anything's at the Museum of the Bible. So I think, I think at this point, I'm not aware of any of these Middle Eastern manuscripts that we've worked with having found their way uh, into Western collections. Ethiopian, yes. And I'm happy to say that uh, at least a couple of them, not the one I showed, a couple of others which were in Western libraries have been repatriated. Uh, because generally a library museum is happy to repatriate it if it's very clear that it, it was exported after uh, the dates when that really was uh, prohibited. Um, thank you very much for a very clear uh, presentation. I just noticed on one of your slides there that um, indicated numbers of manuscripts from different places that have been, uh, you know, saved or at least you worked on. But in the case of Egypt, there was only one mention, mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of surprises me because I would have thought that there would have been a lot more coming out of Egypt, uh, particularly the Coptic community and so on. There, so I, I just wonder if you can maybe just comment on that. So what about Coptic manuscripts? Because there's only one collection listed. There is only one project we've done in Egypt thus far. It's still uh, underway. It's at the monastery of Abu Makar, St. Macarius, where they had a recent tragedy. Some of you may know if you follow Coptic news, but the project continues. Um, thus far, we haven't been able to gain access to any others. Um, there are lots of stories I can tell you about the process that leads up to being given permission to work in a particular place. There's a lot of relationship building and trust building, uh, navigating all sorts of issues which can be ecclesiastical or political. Um, so we certainly haven't given up on Egypt. And those of you who study the situation carefully know that the, the Coptic Church is going through a period of some turmoil now. Uh, their position in Egypt is increasingly felt to be precarious. So, um, you know, we're staying on it. But so far, it's, it's been just the one. It's a very nice collection, and some of it's currently online, um, but it, that project continues. It's about 500 um, Coptic and Arabo Coptic manuscripts. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Carl. Uh, question of when you were in communication with Father Najid, I know he, he took a lot of risks. Save um, manuscripts that he saved. I'm just wondering how that stage was in communication with you, and do you ever have ethical questions about the, the, the question of collaborating with somebody who's putting their life at risk to save manuscripts? Do you ever, must you ever say to somebody, don't, don't do it, remind yourself? So, when did we start our work with Father Najib, uh, and is there, do we have qualms about encouraging people to put their life at risk to do this work? Well, we've been working with him since 2009. Uh, my last contact with him was a few days ago, so we're, we're in regular contact and we continue to work with him and his team. He was doing this before we turned up. And uh, it took a while for us to establish the contact because he was reasonably enough um, cautious about working with an American organization. And what made it possible essentially was Benedictine cover. 
And so when he's worked with other Iraqis to persuade them to allow their collection to be digitized, he doesn't say, oh, these nice Americans came and said that they'll help us digitize manuscripts. Instead, it's depicted as a Dominican Benedictine project. And that's what's made it possible. So um, I don't think we have encouraged him to be in more danger than he would have been. I think what we've been able to do is to put the project on a, a better technical and financial footing, uh, particularly to employ his team, because these young Iraqis would otherwise have no employment. Uh, particularly in the situation they found themselves when they had to leave their villages in 2014. But he, he's a great man. I'm happy to say he spent a lot of time in our monastery and got to know us quite well. Um, so he certainly is one of the heroes of this story. Still, I'm a question of technology. That as you're digitalizing collections, will they need to be re-digitalized in five, ten years' time? Or, um, I mean, how does that work? So a reasonable question about technology and is, is it moves on, because we all know that nothing stands still in the digital era, will you have to do it all over again? Well, we will likely have to keep migrating the data uh, to new formats. Uh, so the good thing about a digital image is, a digital image, like anything else digital, is it's ones and zeros. And you just have to have uh, you know, the, the software necessary to convert that into something meaningful. So one of the commitments that we make is that we'll stay on top of that so that we won't get one, two, three steps behind in the evolution and then discover that nobody has a machine anymore that will read that, as is happening presently with some things, even from the digital era, where they just don't make that thing anymore. And so whatever you have is no longer usable. So that's part of what we commit to. So it's not just having multiple copies, but it's ensuring that they will be migrated to new formats and standards. And I should add that uh, Benedictines have always been early adopters of technology. This may be uh, unknown among some of you who may think that we've always resisted things like printing and so on because it seemed to uh, get at traditional aspects of monastic life. But we've always been enthusiastic about clocks in the Middle Ages. You don't have to stay up all night waiting to ring the bell. The clock can wake you up. Oh, God, we can print 500 copies of this thing. We don't have to copy it out by hand. And so this sort of turn to microfilm and turn to digital is just another example of the way we really do like to use the tools available to us uh, for the work we've always done, which is working with texts, making sure they're accessible, and handing them on. Yeah. You showed the actual priest mm -hmm. with 14 children uh, who seems to be the guardian of a library and also referred to a family library in Jerusalem. Uh, do you have a sense of many libraries that are, say, non institutional or not in the monastery? So libraries that are not institutional, um, not in monasteries, belonging to families, and so on. A lot of these collections um, are sort of community libraries, and I don't mean community in the sense that you go to a small town and there's the library, which is the library for that village or something. But they're, 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 it's kind of the residue, as it were, of centuries of life, and very often the community itself is um, marginal or almost non-existent. And so one of the questions for the future is what's going to happen to the collections, and I think they'll be consolidated. So. Shiite Orthodox will take things to their patriarchate, uh, Chaldeans will take things to Iraq, and so on. Um, many of these places are trying to institutionalize, like these family libraries in Jerusalem, these Muslim family libraries, they're all wanting to renovate their historic building and start a proper library. Uh, but that's a big challenge. You need staffing, you need training, and so on. So I admire the vision, even if it may not be terribly realistic at times. So, um, but the anxiety they have is that somebody else is going to come and take their manuscripts. And so that's why they're eager to document them with us, is because again, it's proof of ownership. And they realize that their, their community as such may be precarious, but they want to make sure that their legacy and tradition is going to be safe somewhere. Any further questions before we wrap up? 
Thank you very much. So it just remains for me to uh, offer a very warm uh, vote of thanks to, to Columba for, first of all, for being with us, for making the journey over here. It's, it's a real privilege to have you here tonight. I suppose you have opened a window for us on various Christian groups, on a part of the world that unfortunately nowadays we, we tend to see mainly on our TV screens and on our computers and our social media news feeds and oftentimes for all the wrong reasons um, but I think that the insights that you've given us tonight from someone uh, who has worked on the ground and worked with communities on the ground uh, has been very enriching for us. Thank you. Thank you.